Our next speaker literally hacked the planet. So please give a warm welcome to Carl Kosher. Woo! Hello, DEF CON. Uh, I am Carl Kosher, otherwise known online as Superset. Uh, this is a collaboration with another member of the Shady Tail Cabal, Andrew Green, who unfortunately couldn't make it to DEF CON this year. Um, and we're going to be talking about Hack the Hemisphere. Woo! All right. So, um, this was done as a project under the, uh, the Shady Tail um, uh, organization. And Shady Tail sort of started out as a Twitter parody account, um, but now occasionally provides real service. Um, let's see. Uh, yep. Real services at events like uh, Tour Camp. And as part of our commitment to always be in your business, we're constantly looking to improve our revenue streams by expanding into exciting new areas such as offering triple play packages, including TV service. So this is a talk about how we explored offering TV service and legally broadcast uh, hacker content to all of North America and a little bit beyond, tiny bit of Russia, uh, using an end of life geostationary satellite and how you can set up your own event broadcast too. So uh, to explain what an unprecedented opportunity we had, um, we first need to talk about some satellite basics. So when you think about satellites uh, orbiting the Earth, you might picture something like this. Uh, but in reality, these are only low Earth orbit satellites. And these satellites can't really be used for broadcast communications. Um, because they're, they're constantly uh, going around the Earth, they're not in a fixed position in the sky. And for broadcast communications, you really want to be able to have a dish pointed at a particular point in the sky. Um, and so, you know, if, if you were going to do 24-7 communications with low Earth or orbit satellites, you would need a whole constellation of satellites. And until recently, that wasn't really feasible. Um, and so, sorry, Starlink, but uh, Leo isn't cool. You know what's cool? Geo. All right, so what's Geo? So that's uh, short for geostationary Earth orbit, uh, making sure the animation works here. So um, Elon's there. Uh, we're out here. Um, so basically, this animation is showing that the position of the satellite um, uh, follows exactly the, the rotation of the Earth. Um, but where are we going to get a geostationary satellite? Well, somewhat unfortunately, but fortunately for us, satellites have limited lifespans. And there are a bunch of reasons for this. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't get into quite perfect orbit and stay perfectly in sync. So you need a little bit of fuel to like do some station keeping and, and fine tune your, your position. Um, there are batteries on board. Batteries obviously wear out. Uh, there's space debris that might just blow a hole through your satellite. Um, there's radiation that might uh, cause, you know, bit flips or single event uh, upsets or things like that. And so, Satellites are engineered for a specific lifespan. And once they are at that, uh, at their end of life, they are moved into what's known as the graveyard orbit, which is just beyond uh, geo. Um, they don't deorbit it back to Earth because that actually takes a lot more fuel than just pushing it a bit further out into space where they can bump into each other. And so this leads us to this unprecedented opportunity that we had to use one of these end-of-life uh, satellites. So this is ANIC F1R. It was launched in 2005 with a design life of 15 years. So if you do the math, it's, you know, basically dead or beyond the end of its uh, design life. Uh, this is the coverage uh, map of ANIC F1R. It's a Canadian satellite uh, supporting Canadian broadcasters with excellent polar coverage. Um, I've been told that satellite services can't be offered in Canada without covering the entire country. So that might be why back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, pirating DirecTV Dish Network was kind of in a gray area. Anyway, um, it, 
coverage extends uh, beyond the southern U.S. border, uh, reaches Hawaii, and covers a little bit of Russia. All right, so how did we actually get on this bird? Uh, so, uh, to, to go into detail about how we actually uh, sent a broadcast from this satellite, uh, we need to first talk a, a little bit about how these broadcast satellite transponders work. And they're basically um, dumb analog systems, or sometimes they're uh, called bent pipes. So they basically uh, receive uh, some signal from Earth, um, does some bandpass filtering on it, um, translates that frequency, amplifies it out uh, using a linear amplifier, uh, and then sends it straight back to Earth. And so the fun thing about this is that it sends any RF signal it receives back to Earth as is. There is no demodulation, there is no authentication, there is there's no nothing. It's just analog in, uh, frequency translation, analog out. Um, and the, the fun thing is that, uh, so on these satellites, these transponders will have a, a bandwidth of like 36 megahertz or 27 megahertz, um, but you can actually pack multiple um, users into a single transponder. Um, the only issue with that is that all of the uplink power, um, all the users of that uplink or that transponder have to be at approximately the same power. Uh, because you can overload these transponders and basically push them um, into clipping where you get distortion. Um, you know, if you, if you, uh, you know distortion from like uh, electric guitars where it's intentional, um, but basically that just splatters your frequency all over the spectrum. And so if you send uh, a signal that is too powerful, you will actually cause interference with other users on that transponder. So this is the ANIC F1R transponder configuration. Uh, there are 24 C-band uh, transponders that are 36 megahertz each. Um, in North America, uh, TV channels uh, use six megahertz of bandwidth, so it can theoretically support six different channels there. Uh, there's also 32 KU band transponders at 27 megahertz each. And what's interesting here is that the frequencies of these transponders actually overlap. And the way that they're able to do that is by doing different polarization. So one transponder is horizontally polarized and one's vertically polarized, um, where basically you can get some frequency reuse essentially for free as long as the uh, uplink and downlink dishes are configured correctly. Uh, so with ANIC F1R, uh, these transponders were sold uh, for the lifetime of the satellite, um, and then companies would buy a particular uh, transponder allocation and then uh, sublease that out to different companies, um, uh, either in time or frequency or both. And as it turned out, uh, we had someone who uh, had one of these subleases. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 yep. All right. Cool. So, since we had one of these transponder leases, uh, we also had a license to uplink at this uh, unnamed uh, facility, and um, they had moved off of ANIC F1R because it was already end of life, so they were using alternate services or alternate satellites, also some IPTV services uh, for, their, uh, for their broadcasts. Um, but they still had the lease, and they still had the license for the uplink. And they wanted to make sure that this satellite or this, uh, this link still worked um, in case they needed a backup. And what happened is uh, uh, Hurricane Ida came and hit this dish and knocked it out of position. And so they weren't receiving any signal, and so they, they wanted to have a way of testing this dish. Um, turns out it didn't work because the, uh, the receiver, the antenna, the low noise block, uh, was corroded to hell and back. Uh, just a, a 
quick note on what an LMB is. That stands for low noise block. It's an integrated antenna and low noise amplifier. So basically it, it it's at the, the focal point of the dish where there's an antenna and then it has a specially designed amplifier to minimize the amount of noise it injects the signal. So um, we replaced LNB and we started getting some kind of signal, but then there was the problem of the hurricane knocking the dish out of position and so uh, we, we weren't quite lined up in the, in the right direction. But as it turns out, we didn't need to use the usual, so there's this peaking up method where you have like these test tools where you get the signal strength and you kind of adjust the satellite a little bit and you like hone it in to um, get it uh, perfectly placed. Uh, turns out that was not necessary. Um, all we did is move the satellite back to, uh, or the satellite dish back to where the rust marks were. Um, so that worked. Um, so at this point we were locked onto a different transponder, um, one that was still active and had not been vacated. Uh, and so then it was time to test out the transponder that we actually had a lease on. Uh, so once we ve uh, verified that uh, the satellite was still there, uh, we needed to test the uh, uh, uplink facility using um, existing commercial equipment in there. So the way that basically works is they take in a video source, it goes into a DVBS encoder into a BUC, which is a combined up converter and amplifier, which takes it from about 1.2 gigahertz up to six gigahertz, which is the uplink uh, frequency for this satellite. And then that gets sent out to the dish. So what this looks like on a spectrum analyzer, so there is uh, a, a downlink on, uh, on C-band, it's about at 3.8 gigahertz. So our transponder slot is about there. When we turn on the amplifier, uh, we get a carrier there. Uh, and then when we turn on modulation, we get uh, a nice wide six megahertz signal. Um, and we received uh, that test signal back without any problem. It was just the right power level. It was about the same as everyone else, uh, right amount of occupied bandwidth. Uh, so we basically just verified that everything was hunky-dory there. Um, but that wasn't the end of our story. Uh, so we wanted to do some custom content. And unfortunately at this uplink facility, we had this uh, DVBS encoder, uh, which was this Tanberg unit, which accepts this input known as ASI. And uh, ASI is uh, basically an MPEG-2 transport stream over a, uh, a BNC connector that is 270 megabit serial. It's very weird. Uh, it's kind of designed to be compatible with a, another, uh, electrically compatible at least, with another video standard called SDI uh, for doing digital video. Um, but there was really no easy way to generate uh, this ASI signal. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, be gifted a prototype of one of the great Scott gadgets, Luna, um, which is uh, this USB multi-tool that they're coming out with. Unfortunately, uh, chip shortage has delayed that a bit. Um, but the idea there was to go from a USB interface um, to one of, to uh, ASI out of one of the uh, coax uh, ports that you could add on there. Um, unfortunately, with, with an FPGA, uh, so it was designed to do this serialization and deserialization. Um, unfortunately, that, that's a lot of work. Um, also, maybe this encoder is old and we want to do something more modern. Uh, we also thought about buying uh, a dedicated uh, ASI interface card. Uh, eventually we did later, um, but the problem with those is that ASI is kind of an old enough standard that you can only find them as PCI cards. 
Uh, and so that, that was a, a pain in the ass to implement. So we decided to bypass this Tanberg unit um, with something of our own. And it turns out that is very easy to do. Uh, so there is a uh, DVB S2 encoder example in GNU radio um, using some of the GRDTV um, uh, blocks in there. And uh, this uh, DVB S2 sample takes an MPEG2 transport stream in uh, at a very precise bit rate that I'll talk about in a minute and generates a uh, DVBS2 signal with the desired modulation parameters and then we just fed that into a HackRF uh, which sends it out um, uh, in an L band frequency so it's like 1.335 gigahertz which the HackRF can easily do. And then once it goes out there it looks the same as the output from the Tanberg unit into the BUC which upconverts it and amplifies it and sends it to the satellite. So I mean this, uh, this is the, the sample graph in, in GNU Radio Companion. We didn't do anything uh, in this. It just sort of worked as is. Um, I guess we did, we did change the, the sync from like a USRP to a HackRF and the source from like a file to like a TCP socket, but it is basically um, pre pretty easy to do. Um, so we got a test stream uh, up and running uh, pretty quickly with a HackRF and a commercial um, IRD, which is an integrated receiver decoder. Um, so an, an off the shelf uh, uh, satellite TV set top box. Uh, connected via coax in the lab. Um, unfortunately, uh, what these IRDs do is they send out power via the coax to um, power, or they send out a DC bias to power the LNB, and they actually change their voltage to change the polarization between horizontal and vertical or things like that. So we were sending 13 to 18 volts into the hacker F uh, front end and you know that that just blew it up immediately um, and so we were able to bypass it with this sketchy amp uh, shown on the right here where we basically bypass the the final amplifier stage of, of the hacker F which is kind of notorious for for being very very delicate so um, be be careful when you're doing that uh, so we successfully um, replayed a test transport stream into a um, commercial uh, receiver decoder box. Uh, there is a spectrum analyzer. Um, this is one of the uh, um, test videos from uh, this uh, site, uh, w6rz.net. The uh, bit rate wasn't perfect, but we got basically some uh, choppy MTV video on there. Um, but now the question was, how do we generate our own MPEG-2 transport streams? So to talk about that, well, let's talk about what, what these MPEG-2 transport streams are in the first place. Um, so they are designed to carry uh, multiple programs or channels over a continuous stream. Uh, they're basically used everywhere. Um, people might hear MPEG-2 and think, oh, well, that's dated. We're on like MPEG-4, or MP4, or MP5, or whatnot. Um, but no, these, uh, the MPEG-2 transport streams are still used um, pervasively, they're used in uh, over-the-air TV with um, both DVB uh, in the rest of the world and ATSC in North America. They're used in uh, cable TV. Uh, they're used for satellite broadcasts, and even your cable modem uses MPEG-2 transport streams. They actually um, take, well, except for DOCSIS 3.1, which does something else, but. Basically, they take Ethernet packets and they chunk it up into different MPEG uh, transport stream packets and just send it as another video channel, which is very weird. Um, anyway, uh, so what MPEG-2 transport streams do is they take these uh, um, different elemental streams, or ESs, and they mux them together and they assign a um, a program ID or a packet ID to, to each one. Um, and then there is some metadata which says, okay, a channel consists of 
this ES of the video and maybe two audio tracks. And in fact, you can actually do a program with multiple video tracks. Uh, some DVDs used it to change like the perspective of a certain scene. Uh, and it was not a popular feature. Um, but basically, uh, MPEG-2 transport streams are uh, codec agnostic. Um, originally, you could do uh, the MPEG-2 standard, uh, uh, video codec standard, uh, H.264, but now you can do uh, H.264, 265. You can do AC3, which is an audio codec, all sorts of audio, different audio codecs. Um, the problem with MPEG-2 transport streams is that they are des designed to be transmitted at extremely specific bit rates. And I'm talking like down to several decimal digits of, of precision. And the reason for that is it, that bit rate is derived from the modulation parameters of how you are transmitting the signal. So um, I'll show some, some uh, uh, demos of, or some uh, diagrams of, of different ways of modulating signals, but um, you can have like a different number of bits per symbol that gets it. Um, a, uh, the, you can change the number of symbols per second. You can change the amount of bandwidth that you're sending um, the, your stream over. Uh, you can also add a bunch of error correction. Um, and one simple way to think about um, this uh, error correction, at least the, the very simple uh, Reed Solomon error correction is um, you can sort of represent data as a what degree n minus one poly polynomial and then if you have more than n points you can uh, precisely recover what the original uh, polynomial was so you basically just add some redundant data there. Um, that's kind of an old way of doing error correction, there are some newer advanced forms that can uh, take advantage of what's known as uh, soft decoding. I'll, I'll show an example of that on the next screen, uh, where basically you're not sure if something is a zero or one, but it's more likely to be a zero, so you kind of use that to tune for um, or to do some, some advanced error correction. Uh, and then you know, you're going to have some variable bit rate content coming in to your, um, your muxer and so you need to actually pad that out uh, with some null packets to keep uh, the bit stream um, uh, constant. And you know, a lot of this is, is beyond this, the scope of this talk, so uh, if you, if you want to know more, uh, you, you can search for it. Uh, let's see, so I uh, want to quickly talk about constellation diagrams because this um, relates to the different modulation schemes that uh, I was talking about on the previous slide. And so um, at a very high level, um, when you send a, a symbol over DVBS, um, you are sending, uh, you're, you could send not just a single bit, but multiple bits. And without getting too much into the weeds, um, when you add more bits, they are sort of closer together. And so when you receive a symbol um, and it's kind of, it's not perfectly uh, on one of these constellation points, uh, you can, uh, well, the, the more constellation points there are, the more uncertainty there is. And so, um, basically, the, the simpler the modulation scheme is, uh, the, the easier it is to, to receive. Uh, one thing that I will note here is that these diagrams on the top are uh, uh, phase shift keen, um, where you basically um, change the phase of the carrier signal that you're sending. Um, but since it's sort of in a unit circle, the uh, amplitude of the signal is constant, and so you don't actually need a linear amplifier for that. Uh, the, the schemes on the bottom, um, some of the, the QAM schemes or APSK schemes do need linear amplifiers. Uh, all right, so this is a, 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 a depiction of what an MPEG-2 transport stream looks like when you um, play it in uh, one of these um, 
test tool. So you can see a, a bunch of metadata there. So there's like the, the program table that defines um, various channels and then each channel or program says these are all the associated uh, video streams and things like that. All right, so this is basically what the complete broadcast chain looked like. Uh, so what we do is we take in some RTMP sources, um, the real-time uh, media protocol or something like that, uh, and uh, that's generated by uh, OBS, for example. Uh, and I'll get into how we did that in a second. We ingest those multiple RTMP streams into a program called Flusonic. Uh, Flusonic basically just um, altered the, uh, the PIDs of the RTMP stream so that we could have multiple streams together. And then we sent this into um, a program called uh, TS Duck, which um, was actually mentioned yesterday on one of the, uh, on the satellite um, uh, talk yesterday. And basically that would mux all these different streams together into a very precise bit rate. Then we send it into GNU radio, uh, either over a, a TCP socket or a Unix pipe or something like that. Um, and uh, then it goes out the hacker F, goes through the uh, up converter and out to the dish. All right, so um, we used OBS, uh, uh, Open Broadcast Studio, uh, to generate the, these uh, RTMP data sources. Um, I pointed this at a server um, running Nginx that basically just provided a, a sync for this and, and then uh, on the uplink site they could connect to my Nginx server and, and pull down the same MPEG2 uh, transport stream. Uh, yeah, went over this. All right, so now that we have something that might work, what do we actually put on this satellite? Uh, so why don't we do an entire conference? Uh, so this satellite was um, uh, expected to uh, be uh, sent into the graveyard orbit in November 2021, and tour camp was happening in October 2021. So uh, we approached them and we actually got uh, permission to restream uh, the entirety of TorCon San Diego that they were selling uh, virtual passes for for 50 bucks, but if you had a dish and knew where to put it, you could get it for free. Uh, so this is what the, the OBS site looked like. Um, so we logged into the content site uh, with the browser uh, embedded in OBS. Uh, we had some uh, cool intermission content between uh, talks and during the night we would like play hacker movies. Um, uh, Andrew also allocated, uh, uh, so because we can multiplex uh, multiple programs onto the same transmission and we had extra bandwidth, uh, we added um, uh, more content on there. So the second video channel was more movies. Um, the fifth channel was actually tied to a phone conference bridge. So there was a number that you could call and just have your voice broadcast to, well, North America and beyond. Um, there were plans to uh, include a number station in this as part of a, a long running uh, uh, ARG called OTP22. Um, unfortunately, one of the uh, creators behind that unexpectedly passed away before um, before we could do this, so um, we, we weren't able to do that. Uh, so this is uh, a look of us uh, testing um, our custom uh, hacker transmission on there. There's the, the up converter. Um, and there's lots of cables there. There's on that screen, there's the up converter status. On that screen, we have the output of this Cisco um, decoder box. And uh, when we tune into the channel, oh, yep, there we go. All right, we've, we've got uh, war games on there. Um, pulling, pulling that off the satellite, we can change channels um, to get different things on there. Uh, unfortunately, I think the only thing that's on there is audio, and I said there wasn't any audio in these videos, so, oh, oops. Uh, anyway, 
uh, that's showing, uh, oh, and we had this fun little uh, shooty tail bug on our, uh, on our videos there that was done with a, an OBS overlay. Uh, let's see, here's another test uh, going between different channels on this uh, decoder box. Uh, so we had this great movie Antitrust on, uh, which is very lulzy. Um, then, let's see, we can probably, I think we were going to switch channels and show, eh, whatever. Um, all right, so how were people supposed to be able to receive this? So <laughs> we sent out this very vague tweet from the Shady Tell account uh, with this giant C-band dish. Uh, just saying soon um, and really the the reason why you need this this large of a dish is because of the the wavelengths of C band are, are relatively large say to KU band so 3 gigahertz or like 3.8 gigahertz versus like 11 or 12 um, so we did some some rough figures uh, to figure out if uh, people actually needed one of these C-band dishes. Um, so a little back of the envelope math, um, we figured there was about 37 decibels of gain in, in this C-band dish. If you got uh, this eight foot C-band dish, um, if you went down to three, you went from 37 to 29. If you find one of those free repurposed uh, direct TV dishes, you get somewhere between 23 and 26. Um, so, you know, this, this is the proper way to actually receive the C-band signals, but we, we were curious if you could actually repurpose one of these other satellite dishes, like a, a DirecTV dish or a Dish Network dish, um, to pull these things in here. Unfortunately, the satellite went away before we could fully test this, so um, Caution, there's some speculation be below. Uh, if uh, this was at ShmooCon, I'd encourage you to throw Shmoo balls at me if, if there's some errors in this slide. Um, so this is, this is somewhat speculative. Um, so we got about a 16 decibel uh, carrier to noise ratio uh, at the transmitter site. And that was way up in Canada, in like northern Canada. So in the continental US, you should probably get a better signal. Um, because it's a uh, more more overhead. Um, so going from one of those nice C-band dishes down to a, a direct TV dish would lose us about 14 decibels of signal. So that would give us a, a carrier to noise ratio of about two. Um, but uh, luckily, we control the modulation parameter. So uh, we can add more error correction. We can lower the bit rate. Uh, we can basically make this signal as easy as possible to receive. Um, uh, there's some stats on the various uh, 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 carry to noise ratio requirements to, to receive um, various uh, modulation schemes with uh, different uh, error correction um, overheads. So like if you did uh, QPSK uh, with like one fourth error correction, so you send like four symbols for every symbol that you actually want to send. Um, you can actually get, um, you can send something below the noise floor and, and pick it up. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, if you do that at five mega symbols per second with pilot, you get about uh, 2.4 megabits per second uh, with about 4 dB of, of link margin there. So it's it's not going to be like perfectly receivable all the time. There there will be some noise that will knock it offline, but eh, it will basically work. Um, and I just looked at, you know, what the, the DEF CON documentary um, was at 1080p um, encoded with the H.265 codec. That averages about 1.6 megabits per second. Um, now, kind of cheating here because that's the average and in, in practice um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a variable bit rate so you would occasionally go over that um, 2.4 megabit per second but you can, you can set your um, encoding parameters to, to make sure you're always under uh, that limit. 
All right, so uh, we, we looked into doing this um, before the uh, satellite uh, uh, got deorbited de or sent off to the uh, graveyard orbit. Turns out you can buy these, uh, um, so our plan was to repurpose some of these old dishes, not that one, it's too bent. No, don't, don't use that one. Um, we could get these uh, new C-band uh, LNBs. Um, this was like 42 bucks for the top of the end model off of Amazon. You could get one as low as 29 bucks, uh, depending on the quality. Unfortunately, um, you can't really do this anymore as of January because these are designed to pick up um, the old satellite L-band or C-band signals and the FCC just reallocated some of that for 5G. And so you need a new LNB to basically filter those out. Otherwise, you're just going to have this antenna be um, bomb bombarded with uh, 5G noise. Um, so unfortunately, these aren't sold anymore. Um, maybe they'll come out with uh, better ones now. Uh, the second hurdle was that these DirecTV dishes have these uh, custom L LMB mounts. Uh, I got a friend uh, to uh, 3D print uh, an adapter for that. Uh, that was kind of lulzy. It was held together uh, like a little clamp. Um, all right, so, so where do you get, so that's the, the antenna. Where do you get the uh, receiver box? Well, Amazon, of course. Uh, this is a decoder box that runs Linux, supports H.264, H.265, is networkable, sits on the Wi-Fi, probably hackable, the, the firmware's in the clear, not encrypted, uh, it's 31 bucks. Uh, so that actually worked well, uh, at least um, with uh, some, some local, uh, local tests. Uh, this was our <laughs> initial attempt at putting up a dish. Um, it's kind of, it kind of looks like the, the L and B there is not pointed at the right part of the dish. Um, there is also, it's missing what's known as a conical scaler, uh, which basically blinds part of the L and B so it doesn't pick up background radiation from beyond the dish. Um, and we didn't really have any good, um, uh, good idea of like exactly where the focal point of this dish was. And so I did this um, kind of uh, hacky thing where I just added a bunch of reflective tape to the dish and had a distant light source uh, to determine the focal point and basically adjusted the, the LMB to, um, uh, to be right at that focal point. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I went home and we left this out and uh, the sun came out, and uh, I guess we found the focal point <laughs> because we melted the plastic of the LMB. Um, so there's a proper way to do this, which is to actually go to one of these uh, lovely uh, uh, satellite TV um, sites, and you can get one of these KU band dishes and actually convert them to receiving uh, C band. Uh, so like one of these costs, I don't know, is like 150 bucks or maybe up to 250 bucks. And basically, um, gets you a larger dish, uh, gets you known parameters like where the focal point is. Um, I was talking about uh, this with uh, someone recently and they said, um, oh yeah, you did a mini bud. I'm like, what's a mini bud? And it turns out a mini bud is um, modifying one of these uh, KU band dishes to receive um, uh, C band transmissions. Um, and so we got, you know, about five to 10 dB of carrier to noise off of uh, one of these dishes uh, that uh, a friend brought and bought over. Um, if you actually want to do a proper C-band dish size, uh, well, you can always uh, go over to China and Alibaba and there's one for, I don't know, 150 bucks or something like that. Uh, once again, you need new LMBs because the FCC reallocated a bunch of those frequencies for 5G. So. Uh, and of course, well, all of this is moot now because the satellite's gone, end of life, bye. Um, but you might still be able to do this for your own events. Um, so for, you know, the, for 
for what we did, you need a very large dish. You need a way to upconvert that to uh, six gigahertz. Uh, apparently, the amplifier wasn't actually that powerful. We, uh, the total power out of it was about 15 watts. There is a lot of gain in the antenna. Um, of course, you need permission to do this, um, uh, like a transponder lease or uh, an SDA or something like that. Um, you could do this with KU band satellites. Um, those uplink uh, frequencies are more like 14 and a half gigahertz, so you need some more esoteric components, and apparently you need a higher power amplifier, so yeah, maybe it's a bit more difficult to do there, um, but there are a lot of KU band uh, satellite parts available on eBay because they're used for a lot of things like uh, internet access and um, uh, I don't know, like uh, news gathering um, uh, with those um, TV trucks and, and stuff like that. All right, so how feasible is this for some, uh, all right, yeah. All right, what if you don't wanna do something with a satellite? So almost nothing in this talk is actually specific to satellites. Um, so there's a variation on DVP called DVB-T, which is used for terrestrial broadcasts. And as it turns out, almost everyone at a HackerCon has a DVB-T receiver. It's one of those RTL SDR dongles. That's what they were originally designed for. They have silicon to actually demodulate these DVB-T uh, terrestrial TV signals. Um, so you need to change some of the modulation parameters and GNU Radio News uh, the DVB-T version instead of DVB-S. Um, but basically the, the rest of the chain is, is about the same. Uh, you still need to like amplify the signal uh, to get it um, beyond you know a couple of feet or something like that. Um, you could use uh, some amateur uh, uh, TV amplifiers. Um, those uh, for like NTSC, they are linear amplifiers. They will work just fine for DVB-T as well. Um, I found this lovely uh, Russian. Uh, uh, LTE amp, and it turns out that uh, Russian cellular frequencies um, overlap with, uh, or some uh, Russian cellular frequencies overlap with some ham radio frequencies in the U.S. Uh, so theoretically, you you could use one of this, um, one of these devices, and by applying proper filtering and monitoring what you're sending out, you could uh, probably uh, set this up. Uh, so this is what it looks like. Um, uh, it's basically RF in and a lot of RF out and a lot of RF porn there. Um, so uh, you know the the final thing you need to do this is is permission, of course. Um, so one creative way of interpreting the uh, amateur radio rules is that so normally you can't send broadcasts over the amateur service, they need to be um, either two-way communications or seeking two-way communications, um, but there is a special carve-out for uh, information bulletins uh, directly only to amateur operators consisting solely of subject matter of direct interest to the amateur service, like this talk. I could have broadcast this talk live. Unfortunately, there's couldn't test that in time, so never mind about that. Um, the other way to do it is to get a special temporary authority uh, from the FCC for testing in uh, unused uh, TV white space or actually any frequency that's that's unused. Um, so ShadyTail actually got an STA um, from the FCC to run a GSM network. Uh, one year at tour camp, uh, basically you send out, you uh, apply to the FCC and you say, here's uh, uh, this test that I want to do and um, you know, let's see, the, the perp here's what we said, the purpose of this test will be to use the verify the functionality of an open source GSM network design and an outdoor test range, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you, you could do something like that, uh, similar if you were at, you know, Hacker Camp or Burning Man or something like that. All right. So what's all this good for? Um, so with a large enough audience, um, these RF broadcasts are a very efficient use of bandwidth. Um, so like DEF CON TV could be done over this. And then if you're like, 
in your hotel room trying to pull it up on Twitch or, or whatnot and you're not getting a uh, good signal, well, you, you can just pull it over the air because it's broadcast. Um, also the, the range for these, uh, depending on your, your power level and what you're allowed to do, can be um, significantly larger. Um, works if uh, the internet is down, um, so if there's geopolitical conflicts, um, maybe the internet gets cut. Um, maybe uh, some pro some sources of inf information are being censored. So, like the EU um, decided to ban uh, RT, and so you can't actually uh, get RT from these um, uh, from like your cable company in uh, in the EU, but you can pull it directly off the satellite. Um, but you know, in, in some places where reception, um, some places still like especially some countries uh, regulate the reception of, of uh, TV signals like that. So um, just be, be careful with that. And so that's the end of my talk. Uh, I am Carl, uh, a SuperSat Online uh, from Shady Tell Labs, and we are always in your business, and thank you. <laughs>